This is a presentation about African pottery and a specific kind of African pottery. I would say one way to describe it is that they are spherical in form for the most part, that the, the body of the pot is either a sphere or an elongated sphere. The other way to look at it is that this work is generated from generations of need. It comes from year after year, decade after decade, um, generation after generation of needing pots to fulfill very specific functions. And not just wanting a functional pot, but needing a functional pot. So that these cultures, these tribes, have developed these forms and handed them down uh, mother to daughter, mother to daughter, throughout generations, learning how to improve and innovate the form so that it meets, um, first and foremost, the functions that they need to meet in order to survive and thrive. And then it also has a growth in its aesthetic qualities as well. So you can get a sense when you see these pots being carried on the head with such ease and grace that these are pots that are that the that they're very familiar with that they handle these move them um, carry them uh, for their f intended purpose a lot of these pots are generated for water carrying and storage so that's what you're seeing when you see um, this very beautiful and graceful kind of movement through the body and these body pots are ubiquitous and important throughout the culture. So in this case, you see them carrying pots to market in Garua, North Cameroon. And here what you see is um, a potter from Burkina Faso of the Bobo peoples. Um, this is Western Africa, where a lot of uh, these great pots come from. And the other thing you can see is that the potters um, are primarily female. The women are m mostly the potters, with very few exceptions. Some tribes have certain content or certain shapes or forms that they do not want the women to make, that they have ma male potters to deal with things like uh, figurative imagery. Um, but that is a rare occurrence. There, there are very few male potters. Almost all of it is um, female pottery. Here you can see a uh, potter burnishing her large form. The texture that you see in the upper half of the pot, this upside down pot, is um, by, by roulade and that's a round um, cylinder that has a, a pattern carved into it and then that is rolled uh, around the pot to make a repetitive pattern on the piece. And here she is burnishing the bottom of the pot using stones. You can see some of them at her feet there. Um, these are burnishing stones. And what she's doing is she's pushing the grog, the, the coarse um, aggregate in the clay, below the surface of the pot, pushing it into the pot. And then the rubbing burnishes and polishes the clay uh, molecules to make a tight and uh, polished surface and aesthetically it makes it shiny and smooth but functionally it actually increases its waterproof its water containing abilities and this is a water pot here you see another technique where the potter is using a um, bisque piece of pottery to form the new pots so in this case the bisque pot is held um, inside the pot and that helps ensure a continuity of scale of form and of um, a, a kind of symmetry when she gets to a certain stage where the pot is no longer um, where, where it's getting narrower and narrower then she'll remove that and finish the pot Here again, an example of coil building by uh, a woman potter from the Republic of Mali. And she, you can see here and everywhere that we see these people working, you see again the overlapping of the, the wiping marks of her thumb. How you can see, if you look carefully, the kind of rhythmic marking of the wiping of the inside and out of the pot. Then you can also see that she's um, working, as she works the ring of the pot, she moves 
um, around the pot. Um, rather than having the pot turn, she is actually turning around the pot. You can see her, uh, her footprints uh, in the sand there. Um, the other thing that you will note um, is that uh, there's a finished piece in the background that you can see. In this marvelous picture here from uh, Burundi, you see these uh, four women and they are um, uh, carrying the, the pots on their head and you can see the, the kind of a, a kind of ease in their in their posture. This is something uh, a daily activity, whether it's to transport food, grain, um, or water. Um, and you can, I don't, I'm not familiar with that, um, that kind of bladder shaped or a kidney shaped pot. I've never seen one of those except for in this photo. Um, but you can see um, again this idea that these are pots that are, are very much uh, functional and useful. And this is where their shape, their form, their textures, everything is dictated by this uh, generations of need within the culture. Uh, here is an example of um, another innovative way to carry pottery. And um, when you see something like this, what you're looking at is something that's developed, uh, again, over generations as a way to transport these pots. Marvelous to our eyes, um, and a, a very common sense solution, perhaps, to their own. Here's another wonderful transportation photograph. Pots to Market, Burkina Faso is the location. And uh, this borough is uh, definitely got his work cut out for him as he carries these pieces to market. So now we'll look at some of these forms. Uh, here is a piece from the Nupe people of Nigeria. It's a water jar. And you can see in this uh, design that there is no neck. It's, uh, it goes from the sphere and opening up at the top into a lip and it's done. And some beautiful uh, applique and, uh, and uh, impressions, uh, kind of etching and in, in, in impressions into the clay. Um, this area here that you see where it's raised and here, those are done by placing coils and then marking them with a tool in a very regular fashion. Here another marvelous piece. Um, you can see these kind of undulating comb patterns and then a stippling, some applique, some more comb. Um, really beautiful um, rhythmic design here uh, covering the whole pot. And these, when you're in the lower hemisphere of the piece, that does help. Um, these these um, kinds of marks do help in helping uh, create friction so they're more easily held when transporting moving moving water. Again, a, a water jar. From the Nupe people of Nigeria, these big, beautiful spherical pots. Here's another example of the roulade uh, technique. All of these patterns produced by round cylinders with textures on them that are repeated as the piece is rolled over. And this is a water or beer pot. We'll see some more beer pots from the Tula people of Nigeria. And this is a, a, a brewing vessel, something used to, to, uh, to ferment beer uh, from Zimbabwe. Here's a beer pot from Nigeria. And uh, we'll see a couple of things here. The beer is, um, is drunk often in a communal setting where uh, five or more people will sit around a pot um, filled with beer and they have uh, long straws as long as five feet that might four to five feet where they're drinking the beer uh, through the straw as they all sit together out of one pot. Um, in this um, piece you'll see these these bumps in this uh, very dramatic kind of triangle um, and what they how they're done is that first there's a little impression made into the clay a dimple and then the clay uh, is pushed in to kind of help control that it stays in its round form. And here, um, the Republic of Mali, 
we uh, Bamana peoples uh, with another water jar. And um, what you can see here is again the texture at the lower half to help uh, handholds uh, a, a non-slipping grip. And then here, um, what you have is a, a applique of a lizard um, pattern, and that lizard um, is in some cultures uh, representing this idea of regeneration, the fact that the lizard loses a tail and it grows back is what you're seeing in this, um, in this piece here. Here's another example also. Um, this is from the uh, Bamana peoples from the Republic of Mali. And you can see again another water container. The the necks. This is a little narrower neck, which will reduce spillage, but still has great access. It doesn't get too narrow. Um, when the neck gets too narrow, it starts to lose function, becomes more of a, a spirit pot or an altar, uh, a pot to be used at the altar. Um, here you can see uh, snakes and lizards as the the applique on theme here. From Nigeria, the Nupe people again, uh, another water jar with roulade techniques and some uh, impressions made from a tool. Um, and you can see a narrow, um, the, the narrowing to the neck, a nice shoulder form, and then a little bit of a neck before the lip is formed. Here is an example of an altar pot from Nigeria. Um, this piece is from the Bene peoples, and um, this is a spirit vessel or a piece that is used at an altar. And here is another beer pot. You can see that uh, technique again. Um, uh, the term for it is the Amasum, Amasum Pa technique. And again, you make a, a dimple impression, and then, and then, and then. Um, you can um, see that then little balls of clay are put on there. It's a beer pot. Here um, is the Republic of Mali uh, from the Bamana peoples and uh, the water container here is the water container is um, used here. You can see again images of uh, both lizards and spiders in this one and um, a much wider open uh, neck and uh, the lip is almost as wide as the body of the pot. Um, here, this is um, a piece from Nigeria. The technique that's done here is um, scrofito through a, ter through a terracotta. Um, there's a, a surface put on of um, kind of a terracigelata or a slip, and then it's scratched through. The potter is Ladi Kowali, and Ladi Kowali was active. She worked from about, nine, well, she was born in 1925, and she died in 1984. And she was one of the first potters to achieve recognition internationally for her ceramic art. And you can see that uh, they have these very uh, symmetrical full forms with quite a lot of uh, patterning on them. I don't know the origins of this piece. It's quite compelling. It has a, an animal skin uh, attached to it from underneath. I'd be interested in knowing uh, where it comes from. I, I've found uh, evidence of it on, online, but I haven't found uh, certified where I could really figure out where it's coming from. I would guess maybe Nigeria, maybe the Nupe people, though those handles are relatively new. Here is um, the Igbo people uh, from Nigeria and a ceremonial vessel where you can see is making great use of applique. Don't know the origins of this pot. This one is from Uganda um, and uh, it's a water bottle. This is from Nigeria, a ceremonial vessel with that very compelling, uh, very loose uh, spiral pattern. And then this piece is another 
uh, water bottle from uh, the Mengbetu people out of Zaire. Here is a water pitcher from the Nupe people, this double form here. Um, and again, lots of uh, surface texture, which will aid in, in handling and also adds to the beauty of the piece. And then here is a, um, another altar piece from uh, Burkina Faso. Again, a lot of pottery coming out of Burkina Faso. The Gur speaking people, possibly the Lobi. And um, it's an altar vessel. Again, a spirit vessel, altar vessel. Another altar vessel or ceremonial vessel from the Luba people out of the Republic of Congo. And here you can see a human head also, as in the previous one. Um, and you can see that um, here in this Nigerian uh, Gaanda uh, spirit or altar vessel pot, again, the human form, this could have very well been made by a male potter. Uh, many cultures, as I said, prefer that or, or, or mandate that uh, females do not make human uh, forms. The Republic of Congo uh, from the Mangbetu people, um, here's a water jar. Um, and again, remarkable head. It, it looks uh, very much like the Nefertiti sculpture out of Egypt. But what, what gives it that, that wonderful form up top is a reflection of a uh, hair style of a, of a, um, a hair shape or hair coiffure um, of the time. You can see in the back, if you look, there's a handle uh, for this to be a water pitcher. Um, so now we're going to make a transition. I want to talk about one specific African potter because he really represents almost a Western approach and I think probably reflecting more tourism uh, responses and what people were coming to looking for and wanting to buy um, that informed his work. Uh, Voyanya um, was active from the 1895 to 1928. Male, he was a male potter and of the Woyo of Zaire, the Woyo people. And um, from, he was, the, his village had one potter, only one potter ever, it was him. And um, that's uh, the village of Muba. And, um, and strangely enough, so he worked, he made uh, standing figures on small pots or sometimes he made uh, equestrian figures on, on pots. Um, they were not used for anything. They were not uh, distributed in Africa. They were not sold in Africa. The culture of the uh, Woyo people didn't make pottery. They bought pottery from others. But here was this one potter, Voyanya, um, who got interested in making pottery and sold it very successfully. And um, it was it's represented not, not in Africa, but in Europe and America. And he's really functioning like, uh, in a sense, he's a great transition to Western pottery. I want to scroll back a little bit and look at some of these forms we have been looking at, which really do form the fullness of our um, of our interest of what we're working on. We're working on making some of these big, round, uh, beautiful forms and um, these spherical pots. And what I want to talk about is uh, Voyanya's uh, example and what he's doing and why I, I refer to it as Western. There's an important concept here. One of the big lessons we get from spending this time focusing on and, and admiring and learning about and actually emulating the African spherical pottery is we learn about uh, a pottery tradition which grew from a culture out of need, out of necessity, and whose forms, the functionality of those forms were, were improved, the, the appearance of those forms were refined generation after generation. And it's a certain kind of feeling in, in relationship to this pottery, uh, as opposed to what you experience from Western art. Um, also equally wonderful, inspiring, but a lot of the functionality of Western art has been moved away from uh, your, uh, out of the, the art. It's a bit of an art for art's sake. Even in our functional pottery in America, 
um, and in the West, we 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 love it. We prefer it oftentimes to the various things that have replaced it, like Tupperware, Corningware, um, uh, Revereware, all the steel and plastic. All these things that are much more convenient have replaced much of what we used to do with pottery, but. Um, People still enjoy using pottery, but even so, there is a difference between a preference for function and a need for function that is reinforced generation after generation. And I hope you can experience this and see this both in looking at the films that I've provided and on these pictures, but also um, in the experience of making these pieces. Just contemplate it, because they're both such wonderful and viable aesthetics, um, and they're both wonderful and viable uh, creative expression, um, and they just, they just come from very different um, orientations. And here's a little bit I want to read you uh, at this point from uh, a book called Smashing Pots, Work of Clay from Africa by Nigel Barley. Um, and here, um, just a couple of paragraphs here, he says, the West has long maintained a distinction between art, characterized by obsessive individual innovation, and craft, characterized by self-effacing constraint with tr within a tradition. By such measures, African potters are eminently crafts, women, persons, being born to the task within a cultural tradition. Indeed, skills are frequently passed down from mother to daughter, according to a principle that any deviation from convention is a mistake and makes a pot wrong. As a Duewo potter once expressed it, you do not want your children to be unlike your like other people's children. You do not want them to be unlike other people's children. They should be the same, but better. So it is with pots. So a good pot is thus a good rendition of an already received design, but it should not be thought that this means that correct pots are not criticized. Even pots of accepted form will be turned and examined. The sound they make when struck will be noted. The decoration will be declared good or bad, too deep or too shallow. This is typical not simply of material objects, but also of the oral li literatures of some cultures. The greatest approbation may be reserved not, as in the West, for superficial novelty, but rather for the best performance of a story that is already well known. And here in this descriptor, you can hear the bias a little bit when they're saying, well, the West only wants superficial novelty, not necessarily uh, an accurate description. The, the West's contemporary art is um, constantly striving for innovation and new inspiration and insights uh, never before thought of, perhaps. That's a different approach. But in this approach, um, I love that idea that it's like a child. You want your child to be like everybody else's, only better. So you get a sense of this concept. It's a powerful concept that you can work within a tradition and still innovate, still express yourself creatively. So that's a little bit of what we're experiencing when we look at this African pottery. So I'm going to scroll very quickly back to where we were um, when uh, we were looking at um, the figures and um, the, the equestrian figure here of um, Voanya. So we look at these pieces and then we're ready to move into the West. And Magdalena Adundo is also a fantastic transition concept here because she's a British, a British citizen of African descent and she um, is a fabulous potter, one of indeed the most successful potters in England, and she works very carefully and slowly. It may take her as much as a month to make a piece, and they're, they're even, thin, precise, um, carefully hand-coiled from scratch to create these, these pieces um, that are perfectly smooth and symmetrical all by hand. Um, and she is, uh, she does talk about uh, working from uh, her roots and African tradition, but you can see that she has almost an architectural or um, clearly sculptural idea. Everything um, from the, the shoulder up, 
tends to start being a little bit more uh, um, asymmetrical and uh, designed. But you can see here in a piece like this that there's the echo of the um, human head pots with the great hairdos. Um, you can see that in a sort of abstract sense there. It's another example. Going a little fast here. Let's see if I can get back here just to show you. They really are remarkable pieces. And you can see that she has a general concept of um, a, a very stable visual and structural symmetrical base, followed by um, a more sculptural finish and a lot of experimentation. So very much a Western approach um, to the work. Now we're going to look at a few other potters working in large-scale coil pottery. This one, I don't think that the white crackle glaze really manages to uh, serve this pot well, and I think this this um, lip is a little uneventful and frail here. Proportion-wise, this doesn't work for me, but I do think it's a great example of um, the faceting technique that I described for you in, uh, in the technique uh, demonstrations. Here, is um, another artist, uh, one of, a favorite of mine, Wendy, Wendy Herrera, who um, is working on large scale, uh, quite large, um, coil built pottery. Uh, this piece is um, about a, about three and a half feet tall, perhaps. Um, and you can see here, these are quite large. You'll get a sense of their scale further on. But coil built and symmetrical at the bottom and then by the time she gets to the beginning of the shoulder she starts to create an asymmetrical undulation returning to a very uh, centered um, and controlled form at the finish from the neck up. So all the action is in the shoulder. Get a sense of their scale here. And here are some examples of pots I've made in previous demonstrations. Um, on the right is an example of the incise and snap technique. Uh, in the center is a piece that is, um, uh, as, as it was still leather hard, I gouged and scraped in the bottom half of the of the sphere here, um, lots of lines and gouges, and then painted over the whole thing with white slip, and then took my metal rib and scraped it so that the white slip only remained in the gouges. To the left, you can see a great example of faceting, the faceting technique. We'll look at those. Here's another incise and snap technique. And again, you saw, you'll see these techniques demonstrated it's uh, fairly simple. The hardest part is when it's still quite soft, you need to take a, a wooden tool with a little bit of width and you incise the clay going in about a third to a half of the depth of the pot. If you go too deep, the pot's going to crack. So you make these uh, parallel lines and I've gotten to the point where I just hand do them by eye. Um, and then once it's leather hard or bone dry, I snap the pieces off to create this jagged texture. Here again, the faceting, you'll see how I do this with a, uh, a broken hacksaw blade. Um, and uh, there's a demonstration of doing this on a um, horizontal fa facet rather than a diagonal um, vertical facet here. And off the left there, you can see an example of one of my sort of uh, contemporary face jugs that we'll talk more about as we get to that section. Here again is the uh, scrofito, uh, where, no, it's not the scrofito, I'm sorry, it's called Mishima. Um, Scrofito is where you scratch through slip a slip surface. This is Mishima where you make gouges or you can push in little patterns and prints, draw things in there, and then paint slip into it and scrape it clean off the surface so it just stays in your gouges there. Here are a couple of student uh, projects. This is by uh, Joe, I think uh, Senka is his last name, or Senka, and Joe is a uh, very exuberant and enthusiastic in this, so he's made this big spherical pot and he felt uh, a strong need 
uh, to express it this way with this mushroom cloud on the head and this big bulging eyed uh, face in it. And here's another face version here by Lily. Um, of an African pot, and she came up with the three-footed uh, foundation to the piece as well. And finally, here are some photographs of the pieces being fired. Um, they're field-fired quite often. We're going to do something very similar with your pots. We're going to pit-fire them, which is like a field-firing, only it's in a hole in the ground. Um, here, the pieces are put on top of fuel, and then they're um, covered with fuel and then it's lit on fire. Um, this is an example of a tradition where they fire one pot at a time. And you can see them covering the pot with uh, fuel. Here's an, a much larger project here. Again, you can see them all placed, built very, you know, very much stacked and leaned on each other in a big dome of pottery. And then, um, it will be covered with grasses and lit on fire, as you can see here. So that's a bit of a journey into African pottery. And uh, so the big sphere of African pottery is, uh, uh, the big spherical African pottery is what we're working on in this section.